trip to see the beautiful things. Change of scenery, change of heart. And do you know what? <laughs> They're still there. Uh, but they won't be there for long. I know. That's why I went. To say goodbye. Whenever I travel, it's always to say goodbye. That is a bit from Susan Sontag's essay, Unguided Tour. About which I'll say more in a couple of minutes. First though, really welcome, welcome to you all. It's great to see people back and new faces. And fabulous for me to be here. An incredible honor to teach alongside this great writers who are here. Um, slightly below them, but sort of looking up a little bit. But it's wonderful and an honor, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation of the, of the week. <coughs> this is called uh, The Beautiful Things, some, and it's just some notes on travel, reading, and writing that would be slightly more stitched together, but I had not so much last night. <laughs> so I love these three activities, reading, writing, and travel, but I am profoundly ambivalent about the genre that combines all three of them, travel writing. I'm ambivalent about reading it, and God forbid, writing it. So much of it seems predictable and boring, and second or even third hand, sort of like watching somebody else watch the World Cup. <laughs> you, know, you know how this goes. I traveled from X to Y and I went to a lovely old museum that no one else visits anymore. For good reason. Had a nice dinner, found a nice hotel, had a nice glass of wine, and a nice conversation with a very nice proprietor, and got a lovely or terrible night's sleep on a comfortable or lumpy mattress. Woke up, had breakfast, caught the train to Z where I went to a nice cathedral. I love the cappuccino on the town square. I really, I really, really hate this stuff. <laughs> there, there are variations on this theme. Paul Theroux's idea of a good time is not to visit museums and cathedrals, but to make savage fun of the locals. <laughs> and Bill Bryson, Bill Bryson makes fun of himself. But even Theroux's not niceness and Bryson's shtick call for me for a while. Um, and Bry I know you've got, I'm, gonna, I'm really offending some people, but I, I would love to have a beer with Bill Bryson. So I, could, uh, I could live the rest of my life quite happily without reading any more of his books. <laughs> <laughs> it may seem odd to you then that I just spent five months in London teaching travel literature travel writing to Colgate students. It was a really good assignment. It was an assignment that I created for myself in order to do one of these study groups that you have to make sure they make. You have to attract enough students to take with you to London. So I needed really, really good bait and travel writing <laughs> turned out to be it. Uh, uh, so I stand before you today, not a convert after five months in London teaching travel writing, that will never happen. But someone who is slightly less ambivalent than in January. Someone who sees what a smarter person than I am would have seen all of them, which is that good, what travel, good travel writing, of course, has in common with good writing in general and good nonfiction in particular. Just a handful of the, the small things that I, that I learned from studying and teaching travel literature. I read some books that I've always meant to read. <coughs> And have some of which I've actually pretended to have read. Um, <laughs> Mark Twain's Innocence Abroad, which, uh, have any of you read this book? It, it, it is really good. It's really, it's, it's long, but it's really good. <laughs> They're more about people, the war 
broken weft of ordinary lives but about plot or action. They revel in the material world without merely cataloging it. Here's the next line from the Sante essay after the, after the part where I ended. Tile roofs, timbered balconies, fish in the bay, the copper clock, shawls drying on the rocks, the delicate order of olives, sunsets behind the bridge, ochre stone. And they wield language with freshness and intensity and precision as if it were more than a tool for making something out of nothing but the thing itself. It, it does seem to me, too, that if all good travel writing is literature, it's possible that almost all literature is travel writing. Right? It's John Gardner who said, um, John Gardner, <laughs> others know this already, that right there are only two plots in fiction. They are. Oh, someone, someone comes to town, someone goes on a trip. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> someone goes on a trip or a stranger comes to town. And the stranger who comes to town is on a trip. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, really, it's all travel writing, right? The, the, the Bible, the Iliad, the Aeneid, the Odyssey, the Divine Comedy, uh, Don Quixote. I mean, there, it's, all, it's, all, it's all travel writing. Uh, Goldus travels. Um, anyway, so it's all, all, all travel writing. I learned some really cool etymology, and I'm, uh, I, it's cool enough, honestly, to pass it along. A tourist is, is the obvious, somebody who goes on a tour or circuit, but I had never really thought about this word. It, it, <coughs> to be a tourist is somebody who goes back to the beginning, who makes a full circle, so you really do have to end, end up back at home. Traveler, travel is from the French for well, what? <laughs> work. Travel yeah, travail, right? Travail, work. Travel is, is literally work. To travel is supposed to be work. Uh, wanderlust, that's wander is obvious. Lust, though, is you know, a yearning. That's the, the unconsummated desire. That's sort of the, Susan Sontag uses the word staunchless wound for wanderlust. Adventure, of course, is related to advent, something big that's about to happen to you. Um, and my favorite, experience. Experience um, um, is related to experiment, right? Something that you, you try that you might fail. But it, it also, um, the root of that, P-E-R-I, is in peril. Having experience puts us in peril, puts us in danger. It is also related, I find this fascinating, to the word pirate. Having experience might require you to, to, to put yourself in danger and, and perhaps even to become a, a pirate. This is, I promise, not a feminist craft talk, but there are some things um, that are, I think are pretty interesting about women in traveling. For centuries, of course, for centuries, right, probably for thousands of years, women stayed home while the men traveled for war or for business, which are actually probably pretty much the same thing. Widows <laughs> 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 walks on top of homes, on top of houses where the women could just you know walk in a circle and wait and watch for the man to come back. Um, foot binding in China you know, had had the the effect of making sure that women didn't go anywhere. Fast. They didn't go anywhere. They couldn't be, be carried by men. Um, heels. Men. Any, any woman who's tried to walk for long or far in high heels knows it's very, very, very difficult. So women's fashions have prevented us from, from uh, <laughs> traveling. Also, do you know what the laces are called in corsets? Stays. Yes, yeah, stays. <laughs> <laughs> you know, once you were all laced up inside the corset, right? You weren't going anywhere. <laughs> you couldn't get a full lung full of air. So you couldn't, you, know, you, couldn't, you certainly couldn't run. So women really, you know, a, a few of them traveled with their husbands. I think in that, that handout I gave you, there are maybe one or two pieces from the 1700s. But these were women who, who did follow their husbands. They were the exception to the rule. But they didn't really start to travel until the middle and, and late um, 19th century. They didn't travel alone and for experience and adventure. One woman, Mary Kingsley, who traveled in the late 19th century around Africa by herself, 
used to say whenever the locals stopped her, as they often did, and asked where her husband was, he's waiting for me over there. <laughs> and she'd, she'd point to where she was going, and they would say, okay. Um, it seemed interesting to me. Anyway, finally, uh, I grasped a, a kind of connection between these three things that I do love very, very much, um, travel and reading and writing, and that's really time for questions or comments. Uh, firstly, travel and reading and writing are all journeys and they are all double journeys. They are all, they are all a, a horizontal progress along a, a sort of predetermined path, a line from the you know, first words of the novel to the last words of the novel, right, you know, from uh, Syracuse to Sao Paulo. And and then they are also vertical flights, um, moments of, of sort of exaltation and insight. Insight, I guess, was down. But exaltation. So they, they they move on these these two these two axes. Um, and there are there are moments of time in both. I, I shouldn't say moments of time. There are moments in all of these activities when time. Is, is literally suspended. Um, it goes away, and, and understanding is heightened. This is, by the way, not an original idea. Um, also, a really wonderful essay by Michael um, Beautiful. Second, tra travel, reading, and writing are all creative. And, the, and what they all what they all create, it seems to me, is, is no less than the than the world. And thirdly, like all creative acts reading, writing, and traveling are um, subversive. They, they ask us, they let us put on costumes or masks and speak in voices. They let us practice our vicariousness, as Stan Burkertz has said at um, Wednesday of reading. They allow us, they may even force us to step outside our usual roles or boundaries, and then later at the end of the trip or the end of the book, the end of the project, So just a, a sort of a few words on each of these things, travel, travel reading, and writing. And keep a close eye on the time and cut as needed. <coughs> travel. Travel. Basically, it's, it's movement, obviously, between point A and, in, and point B. And in between, you see things, some of them beautiful, some of them perhaps not. You, you look at them, you stroke them with your eyes, if the guard isn't open, you might stroke them with your fingers. You say hello to them and then you say goodbye in this obvious way. It seems to me that a trip is a bit like life. It provides new sensory experiences, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, even the feel of new weather on your skin. Cynthia Ozick has, has um, talked about the ways in which travelers are seers, S-E-E-R-S. We see literally what's in front of them and also fortune tellers. Some say, she writes, that travelers are informal anthropologists. But it is ontology, the investigation of the nature of being that travelers do. Call it a flooding in of the real. A trip is something that shakes us up. It makes us lose our bearings. We become, in Bill Bryson's words, he does have some wonderful lines, radiant with ignorance. <laughs> it's an opportunity to learn at first hand something we did not know or that we knew only from books. It's a way to establish authority based on personal experience, a chance to bear witness. I can say, I, I've been there, so I saw that. According to Freud, the pleasure of travel, much of the pleasure of travel derives from early wishes to escape from the pressures of family life. We duck responsibilities and expectations when we go away. Travel is not only subversive, but actually transgressive, tinged with empowerment and guilt, perhaps, associated with independent adulthood. It can be an enactment of the fantasy of running away. A chance, again, to play a new role or to experiment with an 
alternate identity, unlike the one that you might play at home or in your job or in your family. In Jungian terms, travel is a ritual, a rite of passage, a mystical boundary crossing, even a quasi-religious experience. Like all such experiences, it offers the possibility of transformation. I might return a new person. from Europe, Margaret Poehler, she's one of, actually I will say this, Margaret Poehler is one of those people who did return a new person. She was a, a, a blue stocking teacher, daughter of, of an intellectual who did not have a lot of money um, in the, the mid-1900s, who um, didn't get to go to Europe until she was 37, and, and an appropriate chaperone turned up for her. That's what kept her from going when she was younger. And, and once she was there, she became a revolutionary. She fell in love with an Italian soldier and born a child out of wedlock. They were on their way back. And their ship ran into a storm and sank right off Fire Island. But in one of her earliest dispatches from Europe, she wrote that this place was a rich book. Moving on to reading. And later, in a letter to a friend, she wrote that the sites were, quote, to me, an illuminated margin on the text of my inward life. Note that the place inscribed itself on her, not that she inscribed herself on the place. I think that those of us who are readers, probably everyone here, has a similar relationship to, to books. I mean, one of the metaphors we have for reading the book, we gobble it up, we devour it. Metaphor to leave right there to continue with it, it seems to me. But you, you eat it, you take it in. Um, travel is like reading, though, it seems to me, in a literal and non metaphoric way. We read a map, we read a place in much the same way that we read a text. We peruse the signs or clues that our senses deliver and we interpret them in a way that reflects the educational, historical, cultural forces that have shaped us as well as our own experiences. What you take away from a book, what stays in your memory, may be very different from what someone else takes away from it. I know I'm on really thin ice here because I know absolutely nothing about neuroscience and reading, but there are people who do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you, if you do, if you step back far enough from, from what it is, though, and, and, and you know, look at it the way a Martian does, you, you know, you pick up this square object full of black, squiggly lines, and you, you look at those lines, and, and, a, and, it's, and a world, you know, appears in your, in your head. It's, it's a kind of magic trick, it seems to me. Um, in his wonderful essay, Biography and the Dissolving Self, Sven Burkerts talks about vicariousness in reading, um, reading narrative, and travel writing, of course, is almost always narrative, although not that Susan Sunset thinks about that so much. It gratifies our vicariousness and allows us both to surpass and later to repossess our boundaries. Um, it lets us play a role and afterward to return to our own selves. It's subversive, reading is subversive. <laughs> And travel is subversive, of course, in, in ways that go beyond the obvious sort of banned books and you know, fly zones. They, they take us away. They both take us away from our daily lives and obligations. The private and essential nature of reading makes multitasking impossible, as anyone who has tried to read and drive. <laughs> and try. Not, not a good idea. Um, here, in, his, in Peter's memoir, Black Dog of Fate, he talks about work, working, though. You work in odd moments, you know, this job, working as a courier. He, he read that it was sort of work, stop, go into a, a room, right, and pick up this. Yeah, if I'm going to confess that I have tried reading and driving. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you have, too. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I'm here, isn't it? <laughs> Um, anyway, this, this is the inability to read at the same time we do other things. It's, it's, a way about, it's about the way that our brains are wired, people know this. We have to be fully present and engaged in order for the thing that we're reading to sink in. I bet you 
all know this experience too, right? You, you start, you're reading and you drift off, right? That's the metaphor. And you, you keep turning the pages, and 10 pages later, you realize that like nothing, you've read it, but it, you have no idea what the word says. So you really, in order to, to read and to absorb what you're reading, you have to be fully, fully there. Burkert uses the word exalting to modify the way in which you have to be present in order to read. Um, the words go in, the meaning sinks in, and the spirit sort of exalts, goes, goes up. This is, this is him speaking. Several things happen when we move via that first string of words from our quotidian world into the realm of the written. We experience almost immediately a transposition, perhaps an expansion, perhaps a condensation of our customary perception of reality. We shift our sense of time from our ordinary sequential clock face awareness to a quasi timeless sense of suspension, that sublime forgetting the grid, sublime forgetting of the grid, sometimes called duration. Finally, and no less significantly, we find ourselves instantly and implicitly changing our apprehension of the meaning structure of the world. So when we read, we travel someplace else, we lose our sense of time, we lose ourselves temporarily, and find them and we not only grasp new meanings, but actually new things about the ways in which we make, we make them. Leisure, silence, stillness, these are things that travel and reading have in common. You might protest, you might say, ah, traveling can be class, it can indeed, especially if you're traveling in a city. But it is not noise that cries out to us for action in the way that noise at home, the ringing phone at your office cries out to you for action. Um, when we travel, I think we're enclosed in a kind of bubble of silence and stillness that, that really does allow a, a deeper engagement um, with the world than, than is possible at home where you, you are responding to, to demands and email. Um, here's the downside to reading and travel. The last page of flight home. It's that kind of grief. Um, the end of something wonderful, the forced return to the grooves of one's real life. A friend of mine calls, calls this the re-entry blues. <laughs> yet, yet, as Susan Sontag's speaker says, she travels not in spite of having to say goodbye, but in order to say goodbye. In order, perhaps, to learn how to say goodbye and to learn the sort of growing up that, that that entails. To learn to deal with loss, even even loss, loss, the kind of loss you feel when you come to the end of a really good book, right? This is over. You can't, you can reread that book, but it will never be the same really powerful experience that it was the first time. Um, and what, what I love about that Susan Sontag piece is the sort of casting of, of that loss, that same goodbye, not, not so much as, 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 as diminishment, but as, as something, again, that's a game. Um, it seems so obvious, of course, that writing is a creative act, but I won't spend, I won't spend very much time on, on writing at all. Um, except to say this, that, you know, those of us who write about the real world, the world, who write nonfiction, know that um, that, that it is it's an it's an imaginative act. That that no memoirists are not court reporters or transcriptionists of reality, but but inventors of it. It's almost as if in order to to write about a real experience, you have to you know create the set, create the recreate the scene. Um, it's it's a it's a strange claim. But, but John Bendel actually says it in, in his book on Prague. It's what all artists do. They invent the world. In order to write Lolita, Bokhoff said, he had the great pleasure and task of inventing America. <laughs> um, and here's, oh, here's, here's Carol McAfee uh, in, her, in her really wonderful draft memoir, <clears throat> Perfect. She says, of the realization that she was meant to be a writer and to not a lawyer, 
She says, I belonged in a quiet place where I could travel inside my head and emerge with my souvenirs. So one of the things um, that I learned from teaching travel writing in the spring is that I really, I don't dislike travel writing per se. In fact, I like a lot of it, especially the sort of offbeat, quirky stuff that defies easy categories and, and pushes the boundaries of form, probably true of my taste in general. Writing that's more about the journey than the destination, um, and that makes something of the trip itself. Sante's Unguided Tours is a fairly short essay, a dialogue between unidentified people, maybe even a, a, a larger conversation. It's hard to know how many voices are in there, and you never know what history is between these people who are speaking. Anne Carson's Forms of Water is a long essay, an account of her pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela. It's, uh, it's it's organized like a like journal entries. It's, they're, they're, they're deeply, deeply weird journal entries, journal entries on steroids. Color collage, like anti narrative. Here's just a, a tiny passage from the first journal entry, which which tells you right off the bat that this is no no traditional woman that she's in a small town in Spain. Thunderstorms come down from the mountains at evening. Balls of fire roll through the town. Air cracks apart like a green fruit. Underneath my hotel window is a river with a sizable waterfall. There is a dark shape at the edge of the falls as I look down, knocking this way and that in the force of the current. It would seem to be a drowned dog. It is a drowned dog. And I stand mind burning looking down. No one is noticing the dog. Should I mention it? I do not know the word for drowned. Am I on the verge of an ancient gap? Waiters come and go on the terrace of the hotel bar, bending deeply from the waist to serve potage. A fathom below them, the dark body slaps. What to say about that passage? It's it's you know it's more than formally quirky, but it, it's a a kind of vision that takes in, in many, many things at one time. This may be my other book about a lot of traditional travel writing. It seems to be, it seems to only be able to see one thing at a time, one layer of reality. Um, but here, Ann Carson, the seer, sees the waiter bending at the waist, serving soup. And she also sees the dangerous weather balls of fire, thunderstorms that crack, like the air that cracks like a fruit. And the corpse of the dog at the bottom of the waterfalls. Seems to me what the best best travel writing does is sees all those things that sort of the beauty and the danger at the same time. So five minutes worth of sort of practical stuff, practical <coughs> craft talk. Um, things that really good travel writing have taught me about writing in general, mostly about writing personal narrative. Perhaps useful things about writing poetry and fiction as well. Um, you know, embrace that role playing opportunity. I think you know, writing, writing about you, you know, you get to go on a trip and play a role that's outside of your normal role. You, in, in the writing too, it seems to me you you get to do that too. You get to craft a persona that goes with the particular trip that you've just been on. Innocence Abroad is a wonderful uh, sort of hyperglossic text. Many, many, many voices. Twain is a different guy from moment to moment, as we all are. This is another thing I think about the best travel writing. The writer changes. Sometimes he's angry, sometimes he's mean, sometimes he's awestruck. I mean, he's, 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 he, he's not, he doesn't change so much, I think, MPD, but, you know, but, but he's, he's a coherent person with many moods. Um, and you can, you know, travel writing is a, is a, is a wonderful medium, it seems to me, for including all sorts of modes of discourse, recipes, postcards, guidebooks, um, poetry, folk tales, sermons, short stories, a commonplace book, snippets of conversation, um, all of these things, it seems to me, can, can go in. Because they can all go in because the journey itself is a wonderful sort of carrier bag for all of this stuff. When you don't have um, a sort of formal structure that is so, that's the right word, it's so formed. <laughs> it's so, you know, 
it, it'll, it, it's, it really, the, the trip will hold anything, so why not put it all in? Expand for range of emotion. I said something about that a minute ago. And I think in that, that handout, there's a, toward the end, there's to the editor of Battle Cry, and, and this woman uses all those ex exclamation marks, you know, so beautiful. You know, that's, so much of travel writing is, it's, it's just filled with awe and um, the sense that I am very small and I'm looking up at this sublimely beautiful thing. Um, and, and, and if you don't change that up, um, it falls. Um, delight, awe, perkiness, they, they tend to prevail in travel writing. Anger, if you've ever read Jamaica King Hates, A Small Place, or Unseeing England for the first time ever. Two pieces that I think are travel writing that are absolutely furious. And boy, they are mad at you. They are mad at you, the reader. So you pick up these pieces expecting to be sort of lulled. And, uh, and you get blown back by, she's practically spitting in her face. She's not mad at you. Um, you experiment with form. There's some sort of anti-journal journal. Michael Martone has a wonderful um, book called Blue Guide to Indiana. Sort of blue guide format and applies it to obviously a place that we tend not to associate with guidebooks. David Foster Wallace has a really wonderful piece, Shipping Out, some of you may know it. Um, I think it's called The Near Lethal Delights of a Cruise of a Pleasure Cruise. I've got that subtitle slightly wrong, but it's full of footnotes, sort of form that suggests, you know, this is travel yeah. writing. Is, um, so this is a convention of, of, of academic writing. Uh, and a student just sent me a piece that was on leaving. A, a writer said at the beginning of this piece, you know, people always write about arriving. Some of them write about all the places I've left. Believed to. It seems a wonderful idea. Of course, I uh, was uh, the opening line of Out of Africa by Isaac Benson. I had a time in Africa, London, London. Yeah, I had a farm in Africa. You know, it's, it's the end. You know, I left. Um, destination is necessary, however, you can't just ramble. The, the writing always has to have a, a sense of going somewhere. It may not in the first draft, but it should in the 15th. Um, close attachment to the particular, to those beautiful things, the material world, you have to evoke the material world, beautiful or not. In the same way that you cannot subject your friends to a slideshow of all 867 images of your cruise on the inside passage, you cannot put everything in. You have to choose the details, the most revealing, luminous ones that support the story that you have to tell. Um, and speaking of story, you do need one. It's a kind of plumb line for the material. Um, the reader needs for you to sort, pull, shape, order, and invent, literally invent the experience that you just had. People often think, well, my trip to Puerto Rico is my story. The trip to Puerto Rico is not your story. It's, a, it's what Vivian Bornett calls your situation. I went to Puerto Rico and I, came, I had fun and I came back. The story is about the, it's that, the, the situation is the horizontal axis. The story is the combination of the horizontal and vertical axis. Story that's formed when you, you know, you know, you were able to make sense of what happened to you. Um, what else? So that you have to, you, you, as with all nonfiction, but I think especially with travel writing. I mean, I went to London for five months. I'm like, I can't write about London. Everybody's written about London. I think of this as the, it's the narcissism despair trap. I mean, you know, I, I veer between these two poles: the despair and the infinitude. Uh, every, it's every, it's, everybody's been there, everybody's done that. What could I possibly say that's new about London or even Timbuktu? And you, you know, you can't go there and you'll never write again. You might even kill yourself. Um, narcissism. <laughs> you see it, you mostly see it in 18 and 19 year olds, right? This sense, because it happened to me, because I went <laughs> to Teotihuacan, and because I went, therefore it's important. <laughs> That's a bad trap too. Your readers will kill themselves. <laughs> so, you know, like I said, I balance in a really unhealthy way between those two poles. But if you can find a sort of middle way, let me know. Show it to me. Show it to me. Because I would like to follow it myself. Bear down. You know, if you bear down on anything for long enough, I do think it, it will yield up something. It's the, it's the quality of your attention that matters, and not even really the quality of the experience. It's your ability to 
really, really think about it. Um, think about what surprised you on your trip, what embarrassed you, what frightened you. So not just what's, what's filled you with awe and delight and pleasure, but also what was, what was scary. These things have weight for you, and they will have weight for the reader. It's a little bit like the, look at that waiter bending over at the waist to serve you soup. Or look at the dead dog slapping at the bottom of the waterfall in the current, too. One more minute and I'm done. Three, three hard things to say about, about writing and reading and travel. They, you know, it's travail. It's, it's all of them. If you went to Disney World, maybe, you, and if you paid really, really, really good attention, oh, who's that guy? Holidays from Hell. P.J. O'Rourke actually wrote a really big essay about Disney World, but it's, uh, it's not really about Disney World. It's about American culture. But, you know, if, if you work, you have to work hard at all three, it seems to me, um, for, for them to work. They should also be scary. Um, they should put you literally in peril. Um, the traveling should put you in physical peril. The reading and writing should, it, it should feel dangerous. If you read just to have your certainty stroked, then um, probably you will just write what you already feel absolutely certain of. Um, what gives value to travel is fear. What gives value to travel is fear. What gives value to, to writing is fear. You should, it seems to me, risk everything. Every time you go out, whether you get in a plane or a kayak or set pen to paper, um, you should imperil yourself. You should be a pilot in search of adventure, experience, wisdom. Reading, writing, and travel are all touched with elegy, not nostalgia, but elegy, with the awareness that this must end. This is as it should be. You have to say goodbye to the dream of things. You have to finish the novel or the essay that you're reading or writing, and then you return home and you see the shabby things that furnish your life, the curtains that need washing, the windows that need replacing, home and home. In an essay on, on the Arctic and on death, I think this is my ending, the ultimate death, the ultimate ending, Rudy Levy writes of death's overwhelming death doubleness. It brings sorrow, and at the same time it makes possible the story, which is our memory of the dead. The end, you know, the end of the adventure, the end of the book, the end of the life makes, you know, frees up the, the story. <laughs> sure, sure, do you have any questions? Hi. Um, how do you think this transcends into say fiction and poetry? The first thing I think of time is and it was and also lies in these. Um, oh, yes. uh, and if it does transcend how do you think? Does this transcend fiction and poetry? Example, sun also rises. When you say this, then you already this um, relationship between reading, writing, and travel. No. No, yeah, yeah. I think it's true. I mean, I'm, I'm so limited. This is one of the things I was sort of trying to could make you all into thinking that I can talk about fiction and poetry and really I can I can really hardly talk about nonfiction. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean and then and the Bible is, you know, what is that? Fiction, poetry, nonfiction, it's all it's all of them. Um, and these pieces that I really like, Susan Sentex and Daddy Tour, I don't know what you call that, but I don't even think that's an essay. It's, yeah. Yeah, but um, ultimately. It might be an interesting task to think about what writing does not involve travel. Um, a lot of feminist critiques of travel writing talk about the fact that because women didn't travel, when you look at like the novels of Jane Austen, they, they're, you know, they're very much that the domestic novel is a sort of necessity of women's lives, that they only knew um, you know, what happened in a, in a very small territory. Um, I don't know. Margaret, help me out here. Women's novels and they think that they're not travel writing really.
the argument is actually that women, and, and I think this is too simplistic. Ryan's going to say this too. It's too simplistic to suggest that because women couldn't travel out, they couldn't adventure into the world, they looked inward and they sort of got richer, deeper, more in tune with their emotional lives. But to some degree, you know, women looked in for a long time in the home, and men went out. And that does, you know, you see them. I, I was just thinking of an example of a women's travel fiction novel, I think it's 17th century or an uncle. Is that Ethel Bain or is it someone else? Yeah. Or an uncle, it's O R O O N O C O. She talks about going to Suriname. Huh, in the 17th century. Yeah. I'm also not an expert in travel fiction. So that's, that's, a, <laughs> total dope. that's a travel novel written by a woman from that period. The, did she actually travel? I know she was a journalist. I don't remember. I wonder if she did or if she imagined it. No, she, no, she did. She did go. She, 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 she imagined it. See, that's so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and in China, there are images of the exhaustion. Right. The rights of the houses. But she was still in the rest of the place. Right. right. But they entered her mind. Right. There's no true way to trust her. Emily Dickinson would be a good example of a poet who did yeah. that type of writing because she was agriculture. Yeah, hardly left her room. <laughs> and some of her travel writing is so convincing you wouldn't have known that she wasn't where she yeah. was when she was. She could do it, she's like Carol, you just go inside yeah. her head and bring back souvenirs. <laughs> you know Fanny Forrester? Yeah. Our local sort of old author. She was an 18th century? 19th. 19th century uh, woman. She was gay. She hiked 16 miles to Nelson in a blizzard to visit her um, school teacher friend. But wow. she married a missionary and they traveled the world extensively. And she was discovered by, she kept writing this newspaper editor, if I'm remembering it correctly. And he finally was so annoyed he started publishing her. <laughs> <laughs>
she's maybe more domestic. She writes about her chaperone, she writes about her friends, she writes about the parties that she went to in the beginning, and then, right, ideas start to take hold, these revolutionary ideas, and there. you just see this woman changing into somebody completely different on the page. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. One of the things I always noticed about her was that she would present her travel writings as these private papers that were unintended to be, to be published. And that always struck me as, I guess, trying to domesticize them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, she's kind of interested in that too. They often, women often publish their travel writing as letters, letters home, but then they let them be published. They sort of knew they would be published, but letters is more but, but acceptable. Bronte sisters a little bit when you're talking, and so there are. That's a family that didn't travel much, but um, maybe what they expanded. We talked about crossing boundaries, and maybe they cross boundaries with, with, with the characters they created and kind of the reality. So you know, they set, especially um, Charlotte, you know, set it pretty in domesticity, and then really kind of moved out of that. And then I'd say Emily had her own little universe yeah. going. You know. It has to be lives they imagine for themselves. If uh, Samuel Butler were here, he'd argue for the woman who wrote the Odyssey. Really? Sorry? <laughs> oh, well, it's an interesting take. I mean, it, it's related to this idea. Again, it's a, it's a, you can look at it as a sexist argument, but, um, which I guess it is. But the idea of, <laughs> of the point of that women, when doing travel writing, it, you know, may bring like a domestic sense along with them. And Butler was convinced that the Odyssey had been written by a woman because of the lovingly detailed um, domestic really affairs um, that, that go throughout yeah. that poem. It's really what stays with you is Penelope's story. And, and when it, wherever, wherever, you know, Odysseus goes, you get this pause in the narrative for this. Now let's go home this wonderful description of the food that's being served and the stuff that, you know, you can of course make lots of other arguments, but I've always thought it was fun, this idea that, you know, the, 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 the original sort of, you know, uh, yeah. travel narrative, yeah. since of course we don't know yeah. anything about Homer, yeah. this, this recurrent, Graves, Robert Graves loved this idea too, that it was a woman who wrote the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. It also seems to me that in order for travel writing to really work, the sort of great un, unspoken or unwritten is home, right? It, and, and in a way, what, what, that, what he accomplishes, or she, in the Odyssey, is always to remind us of the counterweight to the journey, right? To right. This, this home where things don't stand still. Jennifer, the plot of the Odyssey is my favorite plot of all, which is a stranger comes to town, and it's you. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Which is the plot of about half my novels. <laughs> but I think that's it's the best plot. And I think fiction writers and to answer Daniel should should stay home and make shit up in their heads. <laughs>
in nations that we call the world. I'm thinking especially of my daughter, who just spent three months in India, and who said to me that she has now seen more dead bodies. Um, on, you know, she's seen more dead bodies now than she will ever see in the rest of her life. And her experience of India was very mixed. You know, noticing incredible abject poverty and noticing the differences among the classes there and everything. And I'm com comparing her experience to the schlock of something like Eat, Pray, Love, where apparently the only thing she noticed was, you know, you know, I mean, so people see what they want to see when they go over there, right? Apparently you can go to India and not see the poverty if what you want to do is find some version of God. So. But maybe we also know the power to there, right? Right? We know it's there. It's a scene where dead dogs slept in the current of the waterfall and the waiter, and the dangerous water. We should stop. I start coughing. Yeah. Hey, Chloe.